he has uh, founded uh, at least three ensembles uh, all over the world. The ensemble Sankit Prayok in Pune in India, the ensemble Ecstasy of Influence in Montreal, and uh, the ensemble Extracte in Berlin. And uh, at Ultima this year we had the pleasure of inviting Sandeep Bhagwati to uh, create an ensemble with uh, musicians locally based in Oslo from various cultural backgrounds um, under the umbrella Oslo Musics. And uh, Santi Bhagwati was one of seven international artists that we managed to get to Oslo this year, uh, having the possibility to come early, uh, stay in quarantine, be tested and, uh, and work under these uh, challenging circumstances, um, which was a project that was very warmly received and also showed uh, a modus operandi of uh, Sandy Bhagwati, which is very much uh, going into two-way uh, dialogue with composers, musicians, artists of uh, various backgrounds to create this trans-traditional uh, context. And today he will uh, hold his uh, keynote under the uh, title Curating Musiking as a Mode of Wakefulness in Interesting Times. So Sandy Bhagwati, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Torbjörn, also for the invitation to Julia and Lisa and all the people who invited me here, very inv welcomed me here. And it's been a wonderful morning for me listening to the first panel and keynote. There was so much that I recognized from my own practice, um, and I'm very grateful that uh, these aspects have been mentioned. I will you will recognize some of them in my talk, too. Um, they seem to be uh, an, emerging, uh, an emerging practice that, that transcends different uh, cultures and traditions and, and circumstances, and I'm very glad that I could witness how that plays out in the work of all these different um, curators and music makers. <clears throat> I'll start my talk with a quote. That has become mythical. It's not really Chinese, but uh, Robert Kennedy thought it was. Um, so, who would deny that we live in interesting times? Um, we all know the litany of the contemporary woes from COVID-19 to rapacious turbo capitalism to the pesky and by no means post-colonialism, from right-wing populism to religi religious fundamentalism, from systemic racism to persistent sexist mindsets, from the descent of public discourse into shitstorming and to an increasingly insidious mistrust in science. Behind all of these looms a climate crisis that often becomes invisible precisely because of its immense import. And I'm very happy that the demonstration outside is happening again or at the same time as we're discussing this. Um, it becomes invisible because while it is chattered about everywhere, and I'm doing the same thing, the climate crisis does not provide us with anything that we like, with instant gratification, with, with palpable improvement through collective action. That's, and there's nothing moving. You know, we've been talking about this for five years already, or 10 years, or 20 years, or 30 years. It's not moving. It's not going away. It's not getting better. And so uh, many of us, short-term animals that we are, also in the chattering classes, already seem to have become quite bored with the very subject. Um, it's only recently that we have realized that tiny in the grand flows of space and time, as each of us may be, we as a species can affect enormous change to our planet. And we visibly do not know how to deal with this realization. Like termites, we continue to devour our habitat that shelters us knowing it will collapse one day. And we, the already well-fed, cling to the belief that we, the eaters, might be those who survive when it finally disintegrates. It must be said at this point, though, that musicians and music lovers tend to not care so much about such matters, at, lo at least not when they are with music. Time and again, musical communities all around the world have lovingly, uh, lovingly asserted how far removed their music is from worldly matters, how high above the daily fray, untouched by politics, an antipode to science, in its serene, quasi-spiritual counterworld where beauty, complexity, contemplation, and emotion reign. 
the need to, to believe in such a fantasy has always been especially pronounced in interesting times, in war and in post-war zones, when powerful people found themselves in desperate straits. Music was often seen to offer its listeners and makers a momentary glimpse of a better place than the real world chaos, chaos that surrounded them. Music was a means to look into the past with a soft focus, or to glimpse a pre-shine of a better future. A place to lose yourself in, to sink into, to feel safe, a place where there's neither hunger, nor greed, nor fear, only the infinite intricacies of pitch, timbre, rhythm may occupy your entire being. This, of course, applies to contemporary urological art music in two, often called new music in, with capital N. The architecture of the concert halls in which this music mostly is performed is usually designed to keep the noisy world and its greedy masses outside. Concert halls are machines built to produce an artificial silence in which this often delicate art needs to be heard. And while its composers occasionally may acknowledge a real world outside of sound in the lyrics they choose, most of them would still deny that their music as such, the sonic matter that they deal with, should be asked any probing questions about its real world content. Many would insist that contemporary music should be appreciated only from within the cultural context in which it appears outside our listeners whether they are from another social context or from another culture, even from another art form, should either accept contemporary music's discourse on artistic and aesthetic quality or risk ridicule. In this attitude, contemporary urological Euro art music is a kind of tribal music, the, global, the music of a globally dispersed, self-elected, often arrogant tribe. Um, the new music scene for a while now has painted itself into an arcane social corner it wants to keep the outside at bay, but such self-isolation cannot make the maddening world go away. Music also was considered something special because in previous times of crisis, music was still made without any music-specific constraints. Music in general was seen as a positive thing, even in wars and in autocratic regimes, even if some musicians were killed, deported, or if some of the styles were forbidden for a while, live music making throughout these conflicts and dictatorships of all kinds was usually upheld as a symbol, a positive symbol of community, any community really. Even the Cosa Nostra had its own music to which the mafiosi danced, danced. Not anymore. The carefully constructed bubble of music has been burst. The virus has banished musicking from all the vestiges of a community practice that it had stubbornly retained. Musical live concerts, as such, with packed audiences, used to be a remarkably resilient form. Through crisis and conflicts and other disruptions, concerts remained popular. Since the early 20th century, people could have simply stopped going to concerts and other live music events and listening only to the recordings at home, but they did not. They wanted to witness music made live in the same space, sharing the same air. Now, sharing the same air has lost at least for a while, it's very positive aspect. And so has the concert format. An architect friend who works in a Montreal office specializing in building concert halls has told me that long planned projects in Asia and the Americas are currently being put on hold. The architects are asked to devise new types of cultural venues that would be corona proof. And that request usually includes more flexible multiple multi-purpose spaces that can easily be reconfigured for alternate forms of music performance and presentation. Presumably such that would prevent us from sharing the same air. Maybe they will also let in some outside noise, who knows. Corona thus is also already changing the very architecture of our music houses. There will be no going back. But the world of urological art music, new music, is also under other kinds of pressure. Before the current health crisis, Turbo capitalism had already closed down many orchestras in North America and Europe. In this symposium itself, we will take a hard look at the colonial and other entanglements of current 
biological music and practices. And such debates are increasingly carried into opera houses, radio stations, orchestras as well. Maybe they will affect their budget negotiations with their state sponsors at some point. Then there are the populists, religious fundamentalists, and self-appointed culture warriors of all colors who revolt against the perceived cultural hegemony of urological art music, sometimes because of, as, of is association with uh, elite high culture and social class, sometimes because it promotes and requires its listeners to have an open mind. And ever since Me Too and Black Lives Matter became slogans that brought age-old and ubiquitous, willfully unseen and unheard suffering into the focus of even those who had so far managed to turn a blind eye, the personnel in the social reality of classical and avant-garde music too have both come under the process of increased scrutiny that in the case of Me Too at least has already resulted in abruptly ended careers, intense personal feuds and even prison sentences for accusations that only years before would have certainly prompted the high art communities of music to close ranks, not anymore, thankfully. Not even in India, by the way, where some of the most respected masters of Indian classical music now face public accusations of sexual misconduct. And as to the Anthropocene, only a few weeks ago, German Public Radio ran a feature about how the rare woods needed to build classical orchestra instruments are not only a major driver of deforestation in some tropical countries, but also threaten some of these trees with total extinction. And before Corona suspended or curtailed our incessant traveling, several initiatives already had questions. The urological music business model that relies on both nomadic musicians and nomadic audiences. We travel somewhere to play music, but we also travel somewhere to listen to music. This is a model which started to grow exponentially at precisely the historical moment when the post-war post -war avant-garde bloomed. And indeed, it seems to me that these two parallel growth stories were intimately connected. More than any other music, the audience of new music festivals, which are strangely enough often located in small towns and remote locations, has been an audience of travelers who will occupy many otherwise vacant local seats. I'm the first to admit to be guilty of this behavior of myself. But questioning it in the context of Corona and the Anthropocene may challenge the reason why people are curators or what curators do. In my talk, I want to stay close to the question of curating and contemporary musicking, but I'm deeply convinced that all these aspects that have started to eat away at the once so magnificent and uh, cloud castle of contemporary art, urological art music are making um, that all these aspects are inseparable from each other. When we start to address one, we will time and again discover that we actually need to address another one too, or all of them. In the Anthropocene, we come to realize that there's no outside for us to flee to, no separation we can sustain, that in fact there's nowhere humans can go to escape other humans, that the only thing we can do is to stay with the trouble, as Donna Haraway has put it so succinctly. So, to curating. Curating music events always is a process of exclusion. We choose from what is on offer. What is on offer, then, is driven by all kinds of societal forces. Some artists are pushed to your attention, some others are your own discoveries. Each curator has pet artists, um, often for the only reasons that they found them first, before someone else did. Um, each local, regional, global scene has pet artists, mostly for reasons that have little to do with the art they make. I say all this not to attack curators or any scene, but to make it clear that curating, being a primarily social and not so much an art-driven activity, is subject to all the same exclusion mechanisms of the wider societies it operates in. In live art, such as music, the situation is exacerbated. What is on offer here is usually only something that has passed through many processes of exclusion, starting with the attitude of parents, who for many years sponsored private lessons, with access to the right teachers in schools, often through entrance exams and competitions. The right teachers and jurors then, only if they wish to, can connect the young artist 
to a wider network of professionals. Once established there, there's a small matter of writing grant applications, getting someone to fund your work. Life arts are costly because they require other people. The work of the curator can only begin once the work and its creative workers have passed all these hurdles, once it is out there. And the work of the curator is then, ideally, to propel them from local cultural acceptance into something like canon canonical relevance. Oops. Ah, I saw that already, so. This reality notwithstanding, neurological art music institutions and ideologues often and unabashedly use the poster slogans of capitalism that only the best can make it, that success in the system is based solely on merit. Really? Well, we know the, you know the current president of the United States is based on a merit, actually by a merit-based system, and there are many other uh, events that, that can be justified by merit-based system ideology. Um, we might doubt of such assertions also in music. In a world where all of these things can happen, racist and colonial attitudes do not need to be a conscious conviction. They can manifest themselves in thousand little discouragement, even in condescendingly positive feedback. I would have never thought that an artist from could be such an excellent whatever. Insert your words. Those intimidated by the system need a, need a lot of stamina to continue their music because they will never know if their rejection was really based on anything like merit. Many who are talented, seeing the mountain they would need to climb, do not even try. And there's a, that means that there's a whole population of talented people who make music who will never get into the system. Off state funded or otherwise uh, distributed money. We were talking about money before and that's precisely the point here. The multi-layered selection process offers ample room for social prejudices and all kinds of likes, dislikes, and isms to assert themselves, especially when you think and feel in a lazy manner. The world is full of interesting music, but you only listen to those made by people who look like you, or those you already know how to access, or those you do not need to research only to approve and find interesting, or those that you imagine that you're so-called stupid audiences will like, even though it has been my experience that many audiences are much more curious than the curators think. In many cases, you have to, though, uh, convince them with musical evidence, sonic evidence, not with conceptual declarations. I believe that in curating the disregard for and the invisibility of certain artistic practices and artists, is often nothing more than the result of sloppy thinking and lazy research. Research that does not want to see, see through the system of exclusion that it relies on, and that does therefore not even look for ways to counteract it. The kind of colonialist, white male-centered curating and programming that we still see in many of our music institutions and festivals, to me, is not so much a moral problem. It's a lack of professionalism. Um, a question of artistic quality? Not so much. If you really want the best, then look everywhere. Why would you let the faceless algorithm of your social environment make your curatorial choices? Um, to, many, to me, many music seasons and festivals rather read as if someone had been sleeping on the job. In today's information galaxy, just as Dion said also, there's no excuse. Um, decolonization and Gender awareness to me are moral and political arguments only on the meta level. First and foremost, they are failures, failures of research and of a lack of the ability to listen with your ears awake. But those who choose cannot afford to snooze. So we have, have arrived at the course of this talk. How does one counteract the ill effects of the artistic pyramid of exclusion when one is curating at its top? <clears throat> How does one stay wakeful to the, music's music, the world's musical and artistic diversity, even while engaging in an inevitable process of selection. The most powerful tool of this waking up to the world is what Dipesh Chakraborty has called provincializing. Provincializing means to look at everything that you think is central and dominant and rethink it as only one of many possibilities. Let's quickly look 
at how one could provincialize a few basic assumptions in the dominant music practice. Western art music, a term that's been bandied about a lot, is a music that came out of a small landmass situated on the northwestern corner of the Asian subcontinent, of the Asian continent. Anglo-Indo-Portuguese composer Clarence Barlow often likes to call Europe the Northwest Asian subcontinent in parallel to the equally large South Asian subcontinent. Using this name for Europe does not diminish its achievements, but it reminds us of geographical realities that are often obscured by the term the West that always sounds as if it's half of the world. The next, oh yeah, I wanted to say, there's a wonderful radio play by Barlow and Peter Pantke called Einführung in die Außerindische Musikkultur, Introduction to Non-Indian Music Culture, where, where they play two musicologists in a radio station in Delhi who, uh, who discuss Northwest Asian um, traditional music like Bayreuth, which the moderator always confuses with Beirut. And, um, <laughs> many other jokes that are highly revealing. Uh, I think it can be still somehow gotten. I haven't managed to find it. I would have played, liked to play a little, didn't find it yet, but I think it can be found. Okay, the next point, the sit still and listen concert, is a format that was introduced at a time when musicians could not anymore rely on feudal sponsors and subscriptions, and thus were forced to sell tickets to anyone in their performances. Playing music in a bigger setting had formerly always been a gift that somebody gave to the community, a kind of decoration which was provided so you could enjoy yourself while walking and talking. Haydn famously performed most of his London concerts, the famous London symphonies, in the Rotunda, a kind of shopping mall for the nobility of London with restaurants, shops and an orchestra in the same space. Now, the same music became a merchandise, the same music that had been an entertainment or a background became a merchandise and suddenly it was necessary to eliminate all these walking and talking so that everyone who had paid could actually hear their money's worth of sound. Hence the need for silence and machines to produce silence and music to be heard in silence. The need for virtuosity in music. If you want to play music to competitive people, um, sort of the, the ground population of a capitalist country, especially if your music must survive in this economy, then you must introduce the concept and reality of competitiveness also into music making. But most of the criteria for good music employed by musicians the world over, such as depth, beauty, elegance, spirituality, fulfillment of tradition, and so on, cannot really be quantified and need time and sensibility to grasp. While speed and dexterity are immediately accessible, to every observer and listener. So virtuosity becomes the reason why you paid your ticket. You paid something that you can actually quantify. The idea of an avant-garde is of course closely linked to the Northwest Asian idea of progress and social evolution that peaked in the early 20th century. Northwest Asian technological, financial and social progress as the beacon that leads the world into a better future. In parallel, Northwest Asian musical lives seem to still think that its music also can lead the world to a better music. Other music traditions do not always believe this parallel, and if they do accept the parallel, maybe they still rightfully question the premise, namely that the West leads the world into a better future. To me, it's still, it still seems too early to tell whether the avant-garde movements of European music were really decisive for the future of music in general, or if they were only birthing pains that this particular corner of the earth needed to, to, to put its music in relationship to the other musics of this planet. Maybe in future, um, histories of music would be written under a different subheading. Um, Ferruccio Bozzoni, for example, would have liked this perspective. In, the, in 1900, he, he remarked that Western music was still like a young child. It had not yet suffered any setbacks. It had not yet lost its own self-importance. 
So maybe then we would write about 20th century Western music, so to speak, um, as, say, the internal globalization and hybridization of Northwest Asian music or something like that, and then line it up with other globalization, hybridization processes with other musical traditions, like, for example, music in the Tang Empire, a kind of pan-Asian hybridization of Chinese music, or a few hundred years later under the Ming emperors where they started to engage with different musics around them that were not in Asia. So we don't know how this is playing out. And in thus highlighting these four basic premises of, your, of neurological music making, I do not want to say that they're problematic per se as such, um, and therefore should be unliked or abolished or something. Nothing of the kind. These are all amazing cultural achievements and sources of much musical wonder. I just wanted to describe them as accidents of circumstance, as points on a wide spectrum of equally rich musical and cultural possibilities, rather than, as so many musical colleagues tend to think, as the natural winning outcome of universal cultural progress and natural selection. Provincializing means exactly that, not abolishing or despising your own tradition, just coming to the insight that it's just one of many traditions, and not what we think of as universally valid or beautiful or the most developed is in truth only the product of particular contexts. A change in these contexts might require us to change our opinions. And if, as a curator, you really insist and want to curate just a particular type of music, say so in your announcement. Do not call your festival Festival of Contemporary Music or Festival of New Music, but call it, for example, like this. Festival for written music made to order by white male composers over 30. Then it would be clear what you're presenting, you know? It's, then you can do it. It's, it's, not, it's, it's the clash between what you do and uh, the universalism that you claim that's creating this problem. Again, this is not a moral argument. Um, we are not asked to listen to and engage creatively with other music-making traditions and other music makers because they morally should have a place at our table. Rather, decolonization must rely on the rather sober and calculated insight that it is A, highly unlikely that a section of the world's population with a specific skin color has found the only future-proof way of thinking and creating music, and that it is B, even unlikelier that most of its notable creators should be all male. Monocultures are never really healthy. We live in interesting times, times that change us and our music, and we need all the musical knowledge, music making, and thinking that we can muster. Or as Buaventura, the Sousa Santos, I probably pronounced that very badly, Tiago. Sousa Santos <laughs> puts it the cognitive empire of urological thinking seems to be coming to an end. Not in any catastrophic way, more in the sense that its power to explain our world on its own terms seems to decrease. We see that in order to survive in our world, we need cognitive, artistic, and yes, musical ways of seeing the world that lie beyond those that urological thinking offers us. Not least because those seem increasingly to be part of the problem. But I'm not promoting uh, irrationality and new age and new religions. To me, it is rather Eurocentrism that is an irrational attitude. You know, why would you uh, claim a music university, name something a music university when it's only presenting the universe of urological music between 1500 and 2000? Or music theory, even worse, uh, the theory of written European art music compositions between the year 1000 and 2000, that's music theory? It's a little tiny part of music theory and we must uh, name it differently. Too many provincial thinkers and musicers, particularly in Western culture, have mistaken the world they know for the world that counts. To say it again, it's not wrong to be proud of your tradition and its musical achievements. It's just unreasonable to believe that it's the best or more advanced, most advanced or most artistic tradition. Such assumptions to me sound a little bit have overtones of populism. I would like to plead for less musical populism and more engagement with the real world. And that will require intense study, research, and engagement with the aesthetics of other ways of making music. It will require the energy to get up from your comfortable armchair and move from a full harmonic sensibility, 
one who loves harmony, to a wider sensibility that we could call maybe philosophic, one who loves sound. So, wakefulness to other things, provincializing your own culture are important steps towards a trans-traditional, non-hegemonic, reality-based curatorial visions. While not easy to implement, they're relatively easy to understand. Things become more complex with the third essential step that I would like to call misunderstandings must be co-creative or how to think through cultural appropriation, identity discourse, and the looting of music. One of the first reflexes in rethinking festival programming, academic curricula, and discourses on music always seems to be to frame decolonization in terms of a fair representation uh, of previously excluded demographics, traditions, styles, and practices. Curators and managers scramble to find black or indigenous or people of color or women they can program in their otherwise unchanged concerts. Preferably, actually, women just to hit two birds with one stone and not waste so much festival space with this question. Um, the laudable impulse is a relatively quick and easy fix, but it's also a grave misunderstanding. Decolonization does not mean ornamenting and garnishing your program folder with female or exotic names who all make music in the urological mode. While it is really important, of course, to discover and highlight the exciting work of those who were marginalized in your own community of urological musicking, decolonization needs to go beyond the confines of the urological. It cannot only be about looking at compositions for Western type ensembles and practices that you already are familiar with. It must mean engaging with different musical paradigms and concepts of musicking. This will most certainly affect the very way you work. Venues, audience arrangements, ticketing, concert timings, rehearsal schedules, and audience engagement must be all rethought and especially repracticed. The reason for this is very simple, because if you do not do that, you would engage in musical looting. We all have heard probably the heated discussions about looted artworks and the restitution uh, in Western Museum space. Here's have been a feature of our cultural sphere for a long time now. It first started with restitution of works looted by Napoleon in Europe and Russia. Then it went over to the works looted by the Nazis or the Soviet Union, and then, then it turned to the arts of indigenous peoples, primarily in Africa. Music, for some reason, has not been much affected by this discussion, even though we do have phonogram and sound archives in the same museums that host many recordings, instruments, and documents from the same traditions, communities, and cultures. But in the end, people think probably music is not an object. So does one really steal something from a community if someone records them? The sound of that moment would be gone anyway. If anything, the recording preserves something precious that would otherwise be lost. That statement is certainly true. And without these archives, you would never know the diversity of musical expressions that have already been lost to Christian evangelical seal, military conquest, and capitalist economic modernization everywhere. But it is also misleading. For the looting of music does not, like the looting of objects, take place at the time and place of the recording. Rather, it takes place at the place and time of listening and presenting. How you listen to and make others listen to such recordings or live musics is an indication whether you engage in musical looting or rather not. As far as they can make out, three modes of musical looting have been rampant over a very long time already. The first one would be replacing local traditions by marginalization and salvage operations. Ethnomusicologists who engage with local communities and record their musical expressions often arrive at a critical stage in that culture at a time when these communities change their listening habits from their own music to the hegemonic music they have encountered. Often only some old people still know a few traditional songs. The youth associates personal growth and intergenerational rebellion with the music of the political or economic colonizers and hegemons, and does not anymore want to engage with the tradition, neither making it nor listening to it. This process of replacement of music within source communities is one which many North American indigenous traditions have experienced for a long time already, and which now is reaching other indigenous communities, even in remote areas of Central Africa, the Pacific, or New Guinea. 
In a sense, this process together with the salvage missions into which many ethnomusicological field recordings have turned amounts to a kind of looting, replacing the local music with the glass beads of hegemonic music and then replacing this local, replacing this local music into archives elsewhere. The scary thing is, this is looting with a long afterburn phase, for it continues to do its insidious work long after political decolonization. Indeed, one of the most pernicious agents are not ethnomusicologists or the archives here, the YouTube and Spotify. The musical looting of indigenous and local music traditions very likely follows the famous hockey stick graph, like rising slowly and then going up very quickly in the last 15 years. Um, this is an area where active restitution could be a thing even in music. And it's slowly beginning to work like that. Um, many museums work with source communities and you know, exchanging old recordings with them. Uh, especially in Canada, I've seen some very interesting results in the First Nation cultural centers that some Canadian provinces built and finance. The second step, reframing alien traditions within a familiar context. The context free st sit still and listen concert open to all is, as I mentioned, a 19th century European invention, and which, which has deeply transformed many music traditions whose sonic display practices often are much more bound to social context, earth, or time. When the ritual becomes a concert, but also when a typical courtly display format, such as classical Hindustani music, is represented, misrepresented in spiritual or essentialist terms in the Western concert halls, the loss of context translates into a loss of cultural signification. Presentation formats and contexts are essential components of a musical experience. To claim they are not, and just to frame them in a denuded, um, neutral uh, Western representation context, cuts off the core aesthetics of the music described. In the same vein, Johannes Fabian and Martin Schertzing have variously described how, for example, the romantic debate about felt experiential inner time versus cold um, mathematical uh, chronological time was fought or displaced into the colonial, colonial discourse, um, where the West is seen as having this chronological time concept and all the other traditions, whether they are Hopi or Indians or Africans or so on, supposedly all had different non-chronological concepts that miraculously aligned with the vision of the romantic thinkers. Um, so the world was on the side of Western idealists and romantics and not on the side of engineers and business people. Music from these traditions played a great role in this debate as a munition for an inner European conflict in which it had no stake. Does this not sound faintly familiar to colonial soldiers who fought on both sides in the European world wars of the 20th century? The third looting exercise is repurposing external traditions for internal artistic use. Repurposing happens when elements from a tradition are copied and pasted into a musical event in such a way that their own distinct aesthetic purpose is lost. This aspect is one with the most pitfalls because it can be good and can be bad. On the one hand, thinking about this directly strikes at the heart of the well-meaning intentions and curious ears of urological composers who were and are inspired by something they heard in another tradition, music, and try to make it part of their own compositions. Whether it was the sound of a Chinese instrument or a sitar or the functionality and patterns of Ghanaian rhythms and so on. On the other hand, this labeling, labeling this as looting also challenges programmers and curators who will present a musical tradition in their festival and seasons as an exotic tidbit from a distant land. In both cases, the music not only loses its original meaning, it also is repurposed to serve the aesthetic desires of the colonizers. This recontextualization is a kind of aesthetic looting. The music that was once part of a lively cultural context that included poetry, disputes between different schools, um, different flavors of music from different parts of the country, a little bit like uh, the Etichal Festival, has now become a PR soundbite, a superficial token that, it, that represents and um, gets confused with a real and rich musical tradition. This confusion probably is at the root of 
Pierre Boulez's famous statement, that the music traditions of India and China are admirable but dead. What he heard of them in Paris probably was indeed dead in this sense, as dead as a stuffed polar bear in a natural history museum. To display the music of another tradition in our context without engaging with its inner diversity and complex contemporaneity, especially, is akin to showing animals in the zoo. What all three modes of looting have in common is thus that they rob the local musical communities not of their music, per se, but of their ways of engagement and meaning-making in dialogue with the listener, of how Mele Yamomo calls it, their soulness. They take away this music for a commodity, for a projection screen of one's own discourse, for a specimen. So there's no co-evilness, there's no autonomous dignity of this musical expression, um, and no dignity of its experienced traditional listeners and makers whose opinions and musical epistemologies seem to count for precisely nothing. It may have struck you that with my last example of looting, my critique of programming seems to negate the first two steps. I mentioned before, wakefulness and uh, provincializing. What would it be the point of being wakeful of sourcing new practices from other traditions than the dominant neurological music, only to then be accused of looting when one presents them in your own festival? Um, well, uh, it's often not what you do, but how you do it. And what will really not work well is any reference to the us and them, or any reference to the other, or any construction where the invited music does its artistic and aesthetic work mainly for your purposes, and not also for itself. Decolonization happens only when someone engages with music beyond their needs, values, and aesthetic desiderata. When people let go of the acquisitions. In other words, one of the first questions one would need to ask is, do the invited artists see any artistic benefit for themselves? in this project? Or is it only a money gig to them? This is a question that many organizers and curators have forgotten in general, the assumption being that money is a enough reason for everything. Um, it does not mean that you should pay artists less, but that each artistic project needs to be inspiring to all sides. And this must be part from the project design from the very start. How much potential for artistic growth, the radically new thing that uh, Artyom Kim was talking about, what does this project offer for both artists and for their context? Their context where they are and the context where this is performed. Do we have enough time or do we, do we let enough time to let such growth processes happening? How can the audience empathize, feel, experience this rich web of references that an artist brings with them? How can a Senegalese griot performance move away from the exotic passepartout and as a performance become as rich in connotations, associations, cultural references, and emotions for your audience as your familiar Stockhausen, Ligeti, and Stein Andersen concertos. This require, might require new formats of audience and musician engagement, maybe other senses and sensibilities. Um, it would require what I would like to call a co-creative misunderstanding. Co-creative misunderstanding is a kind of polylogue where each of the participants, oh, sorry. I jumped over a few slides, no problem. It's a kind of polylogue where each of the participants actively tries to understand unfamiliar musical phenomena through their own regime of sensations and perceptions, as Jacques Rancien names it, calls it, and responds to them using their own familiar and traditional or idiosyncratic artistic responses. This polylogue will soon create thousand plateaus of misunderstanding, partial understanding, and understanding. At the same time, the participants in the process are asked to always try to find a common ground with each other through these different levels of understanding and misunderstanding. In such attention fields, between different aesthetics and knowledges and musicings, and the goodwill to understand each other, I would have hopes for the emergence of co-evil relationships between the traditions. That's what I call trans-traditional. Um, because no single participant can have decisive control of, over the result that will emerge from the process. No single participant will have authority to offer an interpretation either. And that precisely is the goal. As long as we, the curators, offer booklet and media-ready interpretations of other, another practice 
or another tradition or of the meaning of the collaborative process, we exploit it through the act of framing it. In interacting with traditions of expressions that we or our audiences do not know, we must force ourselves to go not against, but beyond interpretation. And to go beyond interpretation does not imply to leave critical and conceptual thinking behind, quite the opposite. Interpretations crop up everywhere. Everybody does interpretations all the time. They are the fuel of co-creativity. That they were what I talked about. Each participant interprets an activity, a phenomenon, from within their own aesthetics. And in thus interpreting, the musicians create misunderstandings that lead to new creative ideas. It's precisely in such processes of co-creative misunderstanding that we need to employ our fully aware and active critical faculties in order to examine these new ideas, this, to give them air and water, to prune them if necessary, and to orient them towards the sun. I think that in order to arrive at a sustainable and resonant decolonization, we need to return to the etymological roots of the word curator. In its current meaning of an itinerant conceptualist who assembles, dismantles, and reassembles artistic expressions, aesthetic significances, and societal concerns into new, often ephemeral moments, that is a relatively recent meaning. In the art world, curators have for hundreds of years already been guardians, caretakers, preservers, contextualizers of collections and performing traditions. They care for art as a gardener would care for plants. And it is in this altar sense, rooted in the Latin word curare, to, feel, uh, to heal, to care for, to nurture, to worry about, that a curator in a decolonized music world that seems to be drifting aimlessly through very interesting times would need to operate. Oops, I got it. Yeah. No, sorry. There we are. Um, so a nurturing caretaker of processes, a watchful guardian of co-evilness, an enabler and defender of creative misunderstandings. In this perspective, for me, curating musical expressions today can be an important calling, a process of finding out not what the music scene, much less one's contemporary music peers expect, accept, and will praise. I think we must look beyond pretty or petty parochial aesthetics and as applied to musical activities and pay close attention to the finessed listening, the inner drives, the worldliness and the saintliness of all kinds of music. Curating becomes a sustained research into a burning question. What kind of musical engagement? Which degree of musical sustenance? How much musical resilience and musical warmth do our very own interesting times need? And how can the music made today become a map through the apparent chaos of the human and the non-human world in which we all may hopefully continue to live together? Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, Santi Bhagwati, for this uh, great and very, very inspiring uh, keynote uh, lecture today. Um, what I'm interested in listening to your keynote uh, are many things, but if I should try and uh, turn these reflections into a question. Um, in the beginning of the lecture, you talked very much about the almost uh, objective uh, nature of contemporary, the contemporary music world sort of uh, willingly detached from society. Um, and I'm wondering if you can see any way that through the reflections you have on the co-creative misunderstandings to diversify the music world that we live in, if that is also a tool to create a closer relationship between music and society. So that's one question. Um. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't think we need to do that. I think there's a very close relationship between uh, music and society already. Um, and the process that I described was an isolation from that relationship. So there's a, there's a con there was a conscious process of isolating yourself from 
this relationship from the real world implications of what you do and the real world uses of what you do. I mean, you know, incidental music or in German Gebrauchsmusik is actually a very pejorative word. I don't know why that is so. I mean, I could easily imagine reasons, but um, I, at heart I don't understand what, what is bad about being used for other purposes because that's been the primary impulse for making uses music in, in many situations and we also actually do that all the time. We also use Beethoven for our, um, and now with the technology we use Stockhausen and Beethoven for all kinds of things. And even if it is only as, I don't know who said that, as cultural capital that we amass. So we use it, but we don't use it in a, a productive societal sense. And I think that's where this idea of the curating comes as a, as a caring for comes in. So that the, the act of creating a concert series or a music festival or something like that becomes something where there's a real relationship of care between the musicians, the audiences and the makers um, that one can sense developing over time. So that's, that's something that is very general now and it would have to be looked at at each, you know, in each local situation, in each festival context, each series, how to play that out. But I think the desire to create this link again that was cut, not, uh, not lost, it, it's not something that gradually happened to us without knowing, it was something that the cultural scene, and the, especially in music, did in a very conscious manner for reasons that I won't go into here, but you know, there were, there were very conscious reasons why one had to cut off one's relationship to the feelings of the people, so to speak, of the people around oneself. And, and that comes back to bite now, and I think it would be not a simple matter, but it would be a logical matter to try to go back to that and f try to formulate it in ways that a, a modern multipolar and complex society will find interesting. Great, thanks a lot. And uh, I think that somehow relates to another aspect uh, that uh, permeates your key uh, and old lecture to me, and that is uh, to use uh, the French sociologist uh, Pierre, Bourdieu, Pierre Bourdieu and his, uh, his terms of the social distinction, which is very much about the privileged class uh, defining uh, how things should be, and in this context, uh, musically defining the taste, even when we are talking about including other traditions or trying to level out traditions in the music world, as you are explaining with the looting uh, and including the way Capulet is talking the traditions uh, for one's own sake or one's own taste. So, to break down this social distinction in the contemporary music world that you are so much talking about. The role of the curator there, do you still see that as the individual curator leading festivals like me, or do you, do you think that this curatorial aspect should be totally uh, transformed? Um, I have no um, you know, uh, informed opinion or whether it's one person or 20 that would create this process. I don't think that collective is necessarily always better than one person, but um, I think what is necessary is um, for relationships of trust to be at the core of uh, such creating processes, especially if you deal with, with power differentials. Um, um, in the 1960s, the Goethe Institute changed its cultural policy under the, under the ideas of uh, Lord Ralph Darendorf at the time. And he proposed that you should not send companies to other countries to show their work there. You should send maybe one artist and then let them work with collectives in other countries to create works that are of interest to the local populations because they're made by local populations. And that for about 20 or 30 years was the declared policy of the Goethe Institute um, until, you know, conservative backlash changed it again. Um, there are still remnants of that, but it's not as prominent as it was in the 60s and 70s. I think that was a good, good idea then, and it's a good idea now, to, to create there, not here, and to, to be present where things are happening and not where things are represented, and find a way to make that, especially in today's world, to make that intelligible and perceivable and experiential for people elsewhere. So, 
Uh, what Corona or this crisis has offered us is a new insight into the possibilities of this kind of communication that we're doing now, these hybrid formats that we're living through in this conference. And I think we have to think through such hybrid formats also in order to get closer to this goal of being present um, and building trust in both places, not only in, in one place. Thank you. And if there are any questions in the hall, you're welcome to come forward to the microphone. Hello. Yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> I have waited for a conference like this, maybe seven and sons ago. <laughs> I'm a I'm a kind of anomaly. I'm a a black American composer of classical music, living in this great national park in the middle of Europe, called Switzerland, <laughs> and. Uh, my, oh, 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 unmask, oh, cool. Yeah, I, I come from two traditions, the African music tradition and the Western. My teacher was uh, Zinakis, was my teacher. So I come from these both musical traditions, but I don't have this battle within. I, there is a battle without how I'm perceived when I meet a normal white person, if they exist. <laughs> I say, I'm a musician. They say, oh, what kind of music? You play jazz? <sighs> and then they go through a head thing when I say, no, I do classical. Oh, I see. Oh, interesting. <laughs> you know? so, so I have to deal with these kind of attitudes as a composer in, in Europe. I have to deal with, I'm, I hate to say, the racism that exists in modern music, modern music ensembles, modern music uh, institutions, you know, and it's a, it's a big struggle for me as, as an artist, you know? And so, so in terms of curating, for the curator, it's, it, we have to deal with the person as a curator. What kind of person is this curator as a human being? What are their attitudes toward other cultures? What is their spiritual development? What is their attitude toward the lie of racial categories? You know? and, and so they have to come out of their comfort zones. We live in a time that if you're comfortable, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> you know? If you're comfortable, then, then something's wrong with you. So we have to work from our discomfort zones. That's how things can be changed because we have to uh, uh, drop this lie of our identities, you know? What, what's this? It's a lie for power, you know? And so I think we have to, as, as artists, we have to, to, to go places we never thought to go before. Not to tell, but to listen, you know? And to see all other cultures, not as a racial culture, but as human beings first. We start in the human, level. That's where we, 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 have to, uh, we have to begin, you know? And I had a strange idea about curators. How would it be if the young man in Norway, if someone said, I, I want you to curate a jazz festival. And then you take the jazz curator and say, I want you to curate the ultimate festival. That should be very interesting. What, what would happen out of that? Hello. <laughs> you know? And so, so I think we, we have to, because, you know, when I go to a concert, the only diversification I see is when I look in the mirror. Oh, it's diverse. Oh, <laughs> you know, and it gets kind of lonely out there, you know, with these kind of, you know, and we have to get out of this ghetto, but we have to understand, don't try to make another ghetto trying to get out of the other ghetto, you see, uh, in terms of marginalization. And so we have, to, we have to find new ways by listening to other, like you said, other cultures, you know? Ding dong. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I will take the challenge of the jazz festival and ultimate festival that I exchanged 
with me to the director of the Jazz Festival, and we can have a good discussion about that. And uh, thanks again to uh, Sandeep Bhagwati for his uh, most inspiring uh, keynote.